Vi do il benvenuto a questa conferenza, a questo punto di apertura del Vintage Computer Festival 2019. Come avete visto quest'anno una manifestazione importante, tantissimi eh, pezzi esposti, molto rari, tantissimi ospiti stranieri, tanto, tante cose belle oggi e domani. Cominciamo con la conferenza di Liza Loop, una pioniera della, delle applicazioni didattiche dell'informatica, eh, soprattutto verso i ragazzi, eh, in anni veramente molto non sospetti, una carriera estremamente interessante, tante cose da dirci, e ci racconterà appunto le sue esperienze nel coinvolgere i ragazzi e in generale il mondo dell'educazione eh, con l'informatica quando questa cosa sembrava assolutamente impossibile. Grazie a tutti, buona conferenza. Liza, the floor is yours. Buongiorno. That's all the Italian I can say. So I apologize for not being able to speak Italian, but you have simultaneous translation, so I hope you can understand what I'm saying. I have to figure out how to move my notes. There. So picture this. It's 1972. My first baby is three months old. This picture is a little older, but I didn't have an earlier one. And I know this child is going to have trouble in school. Why? Because I'm a rebel. I'm 26 years old. I'm a California hippie. Even if this child doesn't make his own trouble, I'll make problems for him. So what do I do? I look at my culture, and I look at everybody else's culture. I ask, how are people raising their children all around the world? Um, I look at psychology, education, ecology, technology, economics, anthropology, all the human sciences, how are people doing this? What are they teaching their children? And what should I do for my child? It just so happened that my local college in the country, a rural college, Sonoma State, they're offering a course in Montessori education. Um, this is Italy. I hope you've all heard of Maria Montessori who pioneered in uh, new ways of teaching. Um, I look at what there is in my school, in my college, and of course there's a library. What's in the library? Books. No computers, no tech, no, well, books are a technology. They're a way of doing things, but uh, they're a very old technology from our perspective. Um, the most advanced technology we have for most students is the language lab. The laboratory has tape recorders, headsets, no computers. Um, we, do have, we do have computers at the college. Uh, there, are, there is one big HP computer for all of the California State Colleges. And if you want to use it, you go into a little room with a table about this long and terminals uh, and keyboards. You sit shoulder to shoulder and you try and figure out how to use the timeshare system. None, almost none of the courses use computers. Um, programming is not taught. Um, some people teach themselves. So there's some basic programming going on, but mostly people are playing games. So let's go back to my Montessori class. For the first two lectures, the director of the Montessori school who taught the class kept saying, just wait till Dr. Brown gets here. He's wonderful. He's teaching our students to use computers. These are five, six, seven-year-olds. Um, and this 
two weeks after the class started, Dr. Brown showed up and I listened to him for five minutes talk about what he was doing with students and it changed my life, changed my career. I said, that's where I'm going, that's what I will do with my life, that's what I will do for my children. And I have been doing, working with children and adults to learn for, with, and about computers ever since. I'm not a technologist, I'm an educator, I'm a futurist, um, but I had to learn a little bit. So um, that was the start, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, my mentor, Dean Brown, in a minute. Um, I want to sort of interrupt the flow because um, for, for two reasons. First, I want to tell you that there is more information on these slides than you can absorb sitting here. They will be on the internet, um, and I use slides to give you more information. So the URLs for all the pictures are on the slides, and um, leads into further information about each one. So just relax and enjoy the pictures. Don't try and, and take everything down, especially because it's in English. That's one. The other thing is, the reason I have the picture of the first West Coast Computer Fair. I gave the first talk at the first West Coast Computer Fair on computers in education. And um, as today, it was difficult for people to get there. <laughs> Um, I prepared a talk thinking that I was talking to computer hobbyists uh, and the talk was called How to Share Your Computer Hobby with the Kids. So I thought people would know about computers and know nothing about education. But when I got to, um, into the room and, and looked at the audience, I found that um, it was not computer hobbyists at all who had come to this talk. It was teachers and they wanted to know how to use computers in their classroom. This was not what I'd prepared, so I had to throw out my speech <laughs> and do it completely uh, ad lib. So my question to you is, I, have, I, I would like you to raise your hand um, for one of these. Would you prefer to hear personal stories about the characters and the people, or would you like to hear about how we taught with computers in the early days? Or would you like to hear more about what I think is coming in the future? So those are the three questions. First, personal stories. Who would like to hear personal stories? A few. Okay, who would like to hear how we taught in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? A few. Am I getting future for the third one? Who wants to hear about the future? And this will be my ideas. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know about what the future will be. I know what I wish it will be. Okay, that's wonderful. This is my favorite topic. So I will go a little faster through some of the slides that are about the old days and pause more to talk about the new days. And I'll do the talk and then I hope we will have a little time left for you to ask questions. And I'm, I will be available throughout the, the festival Please come and talk to me whenever you want to. Um, so let me talk about, come on. That's right, it's there. Um, this was my mentor, Dean Brown. Um, he was not either professionally an educator or a computer scientist. He was trained as a nuclear physicist, worked in peace studies, he was a meditator, so he studied um, transcendental meditation. He was a religious scholar. He was um, an enthusiast of William Blake and loved art and poetry. So a Renaissance man, a person who knew about all kinds of other things. He knew every uh, flower and plant that grew in California. If you showed it to him, he could name it with its Latin name. Um, Five minutes I listened to him talk about working with little kids and computers, and I'm sold, I'm gone. He was willing to be my mentor. He taught me um, everything I knew about the beginning of computing and introduced me 
to all of the people in Northern California and many people around the country who um, were interested in how we could use this new technology to enhance learning and teaching. Oops, that's the wrong slide. Um, all the people that I met were dreamers. They were people like Dean who had a broad picture of the world um, and were really interested in how this technology would influence our lives and our learning. They were not elementary and secondary school teachers. Um, some of them were university teachers, so you could call them educators, but usually they had some other professional specialty. Um, see, does the curse? The cursor doesn't show. I'm pointing at the top picture at the top. That's the first mouse that Doug Engelbart put together. So Dean took me to meet Eng Engelbart and showed me the mouse. Um, he introduced me to this set of very early educational software, which was funded by the National Science Foundation in the US, um, where the only way to share programs was to print on paper the listing. So this particular picture is a uh, population studies, um, and it's a simulation of what happens if you sterilize the mosquitoes. Um, but the programs that told you what the outcomes would be were written in BASIC and listed in the paper, and you got to type them into your computer, if you were so lucky as to have a computer. Um, these were originally, these were public domain because they were funded by the, the National Science Foundation, but they were published, the paper was published by the Digital Equipment Corporation. So you'll see, um, if you go and look these up, um, that they say copyright Digital Equipment Corporation, but they're really public domain. And on this slide is the URL. What I'm doing is, um, is public, republishing all of this material so it will be available to anyone. Um, one of the other people that Dean introduced me to was Bob Albrecht. Um, Bob Albrecht created, he, he started out in 1963 or earlier teaching high school students about computing. He wrote the original basic language manual for the US Navy and continued to work in education. He's in his late 80s now, he's still working in education. It's difficult to find him on the web. He's a very private person. But um, every basic manual that you got with your TRS-80, with your Apple, with your Atari, was written by Bob Albrecht. A few of them were edited by me. <laughs> um, he started the first public access computer center in a storefront in Menlo Park, California, called Peter's Com People's Computer Company. And that was one of the only places outside of a museum, a science museum, that you could, that the public could put their hands on a computer. Um, the second one, which was modeled after uh, Bob's People's Computer Company, People's Computer Center, was my loop center that I did in uh, Katati, California. Um, after Loop, Loop Center was only open as a public uh, walk-in space for three years. After that, I went to work for Bob um, on this project called Computer Town USA, which was the first time computers were put in libraries for use by the library patrons instead of by the librarians. So we taught thousands of kids and their parents how to use their first computer and projected that idea all over the world. Eventually we had Computer Town International and there were little people used this book, um, which is also available online, um, to, to figure out how to begin to present computers to, um, to the general public. So Bob was really influential and as I said, still is. Um, all of this material I'm trying to organize and put together in a virtual museum. If you go to hcle.org, um, that's the beginning of the access to all of these materials. I have 200 boxes of documents 
and probably 50 computers um, and notes and letters to people, um, old videos, lots of things I can't even play anymore. And my effort today and, and ongoing is to try to get this material online. I don't want to run a physical museum. That's too much work. But what I want to do is make it virtual so everyone can get at it. That's background. Let's uh, go back to that uh, Montessori classroom in, in the 70s. Um, what was it like for these children to begin to encounter a computer? Um, you can see a little bit about what it was like in this book called My Friend the Computer, and that's already online, so you can download that. I did copy one page of it. So you can see what the kids had to do was the first thing they had to do was turn on the teletype. And for those of you who are a little younger, teletype was the machine you used to sell, send telegrams with. It was not originally a computer terminal because there were no computers when the teletype was in use. So you turned on the teletype, and I saw that um, there are some examples in the exhibit hall of an acoustic coupler that you put the old phone handset into. Um, so we had five and six-year-olds, or Dean had five and six-year-olds doing this, calling up, listening to the, for the buzz on the phone line, putting the, um, the handset into the acoustic coupler, hoping that the teletype went click and the connection was made. And then they had to type some uh, access codes to get onto their account at the computer, which was, in this case, it was uh, at the Lawrence Hall of Science Museum in Berkeley. And the school was the Maria Montessori of the Golden Gate in San Francisco. So it's 30 kilometers away that their computer is from the terminal. Um, there are that whole process is documented in this book and in many others, and some of you already know that. Um, but you can imagine there was a whole lot of learning that you had to do um, about the computer system and how to get this conglomeration, this collection of the equipment to work before you could begin to contact the actual educational lesson that was the reason for using the computer in education. Um, I have in my notes here, if, if you want to understand how this worked, ask somebody who's over 60 years old. Um, keep in mind that there's no screens at this time. There's only paper. And also keep in mind that um, there's no graphics. If you want to send a picture or draw a diagram, you have to use typewriter characters to do it. So that's the scene in the Montessori school and the scene for years afterwards with computers in schools. So what are, what are people learning from using this kind of a system? They are learning systems. They are learning that um, when you want to do something complex, it's made up as a series of parts that have connections together. And that's a very important basic concept. It's a completely different concept than what you have when you take this out of your pocket. Um, because you are in contact with the components of the system and you learn how to make them talk to each other. Um, the kids, there, were no, there was no software, so everybody was programming. So you learned the concept of a program. You learned that you're taking a series of relatively simple logical steps and combining them to make something complicated. You learn the notion of a simulation or a model. Um, you learn that what you programmed or what you encountered in a program was not the real thing. It was simpler. A lot of the parts were left out. Um, and you understood that you weren't getting the whole story. So today, when we do weather forecasting, we're using computer models. But the people who are listening to the weather forecast today don't have any idea that what they're getting is a simulation. They don't know they're not getting the real weather. And they don't know how sim simulations are built. So this is something that I think we've lost 
in the way that we do, we use computers for education today. Another thing that they learned was the concept of garbage in, garbage out. Because they're doing their own programming, they can make the computer lie. Um, this is a tremendous amount of power because little kids often don't get that opportunity. Um, they're learning authorship. They're learning independence. They're, they're learning control. For many, they're telling the computer what to do. They're not having the computer tell them what to do. And for, for many, many young children, this is the first time they get to be in charge. And it's liberating, it's exciting. They wanted to do this. You didn't have to make them do this, as we don't have to make you be interested in, in uh, computing. Another thing they learned was collaboration. Um, they're working together. One person will discover one thing, a different student will discover something else, and they'll teach each other. Um, the teacher often doesn't know as much about what they're doing as the students do. So this whole spirit of collaboration was part of what happened with early computing and education. And they learned what, what the name for that has now been coined. It's called pyragogy. Um, since you know more about these other six things, I'm going to say a little more about pyragogy. The, the term comes from Howard Rheingold. Um, who was a journalist and who started studying um, online communities very early. Um, and Howard is also still with us in writing today. He's an adjunct professor at Stanford and teaches his classes using pedagogy, where andragogy is the teaching of adults, pedagogy is the teaching of ch children, and pedagogy is the teaching of each other. And one of the things that was, for me, so exciting about the early experience of using computers in learning situations was we were all beginners. We were all both teachers and learners. And so I, I love this word, pyragogy. Um, Dean introduced me to hundreds of different people. Maybe not hundreds, but a lot. Um, they were all dreamers, and I can't tell you about all of them in this talk, but that's the reason for the virtual museum. Um, they were, as I said, there were no there were no computers that, that ordinary people could get to in the 50s and 60s. But these, these pioneers, these dreamers, thought about what we would have. They imagined what we have today and asked the question, what can we do with education? Since they didn't have it to implement, they didn't have the limitations on their thought that we have today. So we envisioned something quite different than what we have today. These are people, I mean, you can read about, you can read uh, Norbert Wiener from MIT, Doug Engelbart was at SRI, John Kemeny was at Dartmouth. This is, uh, this second pic the book is, is John Kemeny's book, which is fascinating. I read it again last year. Um, Nicholas Negroponte uh, and Seymour Papert, who were both at MIT. Um, I had an opportunity of studying with Seymour, and it was fantastic. Um, John Seely Brown I met at Xerox Park, um, Alan Kay, many, many others, including Dean and Howard. Um, they saw the partnership between the computer and the human as being how do we make the best use of each one, not how do we put the computer in charge of the people and have it constantly limiting us and telling us what to do? What we early envisioned was having the computers do the number crunching, the storage and the retrieval of whole libraries versus information. And we have that now. We also imagined worldwide telecommunications so that the people would connect to each other using the machines. And we assumed that the creativity, the art, and the social interaction would remain the domain of the human beings. So what actually happened? Well, we had the dreamers in the 70s. Um, and then during the 80s, 90s, and, and the aughts, um, 
we had this huge development, as you well know, of hardware and software and the popularization of the personal computer. Um, and then during the decade we're in now, which is the end of the teens, we had the internet, and then we have the future that we can still imagine. And I hope that what we'll end up doing is having a better future for having talked about it than we would if we just said, oh well, somebody else will do it. During that 30 years of development, um, I think there were three things that happened that were most important, and they're most important for education as well as computing in every other field. One is the cost of computing came down. So you all know Moore's law that the computing power increases exponentially and the cost decreases um, linearly but still significantly. Um, our ability to store and retrieve information has exploded probably beyond our wildest dreams. If you, if you read those early books, you will not see the level of storage that we have today. Um, today, even farmers in Africa and India have connectivity, have storage and retrieval, have access to huge quantities of information and are using that in different ways. They're learning and teaching from that in different ways than we used to. We have the connectivity. We have the early internet was only four nodes <clears throat> and it's grown to what, you, what we have, what we use today. Um, where I live in the country in Northern California, my connectivity is horrible. <laughs> so it's not global yet. We still have to rely on the ham radio operators occasionally. And uh, I often find out I have no connectivity. But around the world, it's pretty impressive. That's the second major development in my analysis. The third one is the development of the applications. So there's an application for everything today, um, whether it's sniffing out uh, encyclopedias worth of information, whether it's wonderful games, whether it's entertainment where you can get every movie and every TV show. Um, there's applications for all kinds of business transactions, even preheating your oven while you're not home with the Internet of Things. That's what's been developed in the last 30 years. How are we applying that to education? How, what, what are we doing with our applications for teaching and learning? There has been a lot of change, but I'm not convinced it's all been positive. I think that most of the effort in computing and education, exclusive of teaching programming and computer science, but in teaching other things with the computer as a helper, I think most of it has been to simulate a traditional school we're using an old model of, of classroom instruction. And in many, many cases, we're using the computer as a fancy way of turning pages that are printed, that are, that are just copies of printed book pages. This is a travesty. We shouldn't be doing this. What we're doing is creating virtual schools. So now you can get the same experience you got by going to a classroom sitting on your bed at home. Is this a good thing? Mm -mm. Probably for some people, it's better than what we had, um, but it also loses a lot. So I don't think overall it's a plus. We do have what we call in, in the States a blended classroom where some of the teaching is online and some of it is face-to-face. -face. We have an increase in what's called project-based learning. It should be called project-based teaching. Um, where a group of students will be asked to do a project, take on a task, solve a problem, and they'll work together in groups. There's more of that than there used to be. It has its pluses and its minuses. And we have a lot more open educational resources. These are the resources that are online, everything from the major university courses, although often you get a lecture with 
no assignments and no feedback, or you get the assignments with no lecture. So the open educational resources, which are free or very low cost, are still not the level that we need in education. So I don't think we've achieved the fundamental changes that those early dreamers envisioned. Um, and I think that formal educators are going, and classroom teachers in, in many elementary and secondary schools, as well as less in universities, but also in universities, are not going in the directions I would like to see them go. There's a lot that's been done, but there's a lot more to do. So my interest is not in looking at what's being done in traditional classrooms today, but in looking at what we could do in the future and who's doing that future. So I have a new hero. Um, if we want to get away from the, the confining, constricting, closing down world of the closed walled classroom um, and into widening horizons, this is the way to go. Um, this is the work of uh, an Indian gentleman named Sugata Mitra, who was an industrialist. And what he, in, in India, um, often the companies are inside walled compounds and the street kids are outside, the poor kids. So what he did was he made a hole in the wall you, so you can find this hole in the wall project online. And uh, Mitra is now lecturing and full-time working in education. Um, he put a comp an, an internet enabled computer and a keyboard through the hole in the wall and watched what happened. What he found, he, he found that the kids taught themselves English. They didn't know English before. They taught themselves how to surf the net and the ones who could figure it out taught each other. So what he says in the, on some of his YouTube videos is when you call the helpline and you get someone who's a customer service representative in India um, and they are probably speaking English, but I assume there are some who speak Italian. Um, they may have been originally these kids in the street who first learned, taught themselves to use computers. Um, they organized their own learning. They didn't have teachers, but they had an environment to explore. Um, this is very reflective of Montessori's uh, approach at, in 1900. Um, so Mitra, having figured out and demonstrated that kids could teach themselves languages and to use the internet, started a series of experiments. One of them was, can kids teach themselves um, molecular biology? Can they teach themselves DNA replication from not knowing any English, not having a teacher, just having access to the computer and the question? Um, and he did a controlled experiment where he had a classroom of kids with a professional teacher teaching them about uh, DNA replication, and the street kids learning it, teaching themselves. Um, his experiment was successful. The, the, the self-taught kids, in the end, did best, better on the tests of mastering the material than the, than the classroom-taught kids. Um, another thing that he experimented with and found works is that more than content specialist teachers the kids needed what he calls the grandmother model. They needed somebody to say whatever they did. Oh, that's great. How did you do that? And then the kids would explain to the grandmother, who might understand or might not. So Mitra is now providing kids with online grandmothers who check in every day or two. What are you doing? How did you do that? Oh, that's interesting. Did you, did you like that? Uh, how did you do that? And he finds that's more important in today's context than having a specialist teacher who knows the material that the kids are learning. So he's really playing with the idea of education as a self-organization, which is a, the embodiment of pyragogy. Um, 
he's, this is how he um, uh, demonstrates or how he explains his method. You have broadband, huge information source, the internet. You have groups of people together, whether they're children or adults, so that they can collaborate on their learning. Um, and you have the grandmother who's there to encourage and admire what they do. And that, he says, are the keys to education. The computer is there, but it's not the important part. So for me, this has been really exciting to discover Mitra's work because I've been talking about this and trying to understand it for, for years, for 50 years, and trying to find colleagues who wanted to do this. The early dreamers were interested, but they couldn't implement because they didn't have the last 40 years of hardware and software development. Now we have it. We also have an educational infrastructure, which is still more like this, where the teacher is the locus of control. The teacher is in charge. The teacher sets the learning goals. The teacher has analyzes the learner and decides what materials they should learn from, and then provides those materials in the classroom. Um, this is not self-organized learning. This is classroom and teacher-centered learning. Um, what I prefer, and I think is the way of the future, is um, that we put the learner in control. The learner sets the goals. The learner has a huge access to all kinds of educational resources, whether it's pre-programmed courses, whether it's Wikipedia, whether it's YouTubes on everything. Um, and uh, so the learner begins to put themselves in control, choose their own goals, choose their own methods of learning. Um, we do still need instructional designers. We still need people to take and interpret the materials in many different ways. Um, and, we can and we can crowdsource that. I didn't put in the slides the Saul Academy. I don't know if you've run into uh, Mr. Saul, who is also Indian, who started making um, little video lessons for his, um, it's Khan Academy, it's Saul Khan, I'm sorry, K-A-H-N. Um, he started making little videos for his nephews on mathematics and little three to six minute uh, lessons, which were, are all now in the open educational resource world so that anybody can get those. So rather than having a huge school that tells you what to do, you get a little lesson. It says, this helps you do this, this helps you do that. So we still need instructional designers, but we move the teacher down to be an instructional resource instead of being the control of what you're going to learn when, where, and how. Um, of course, this already happens outside of schools because we're all learners. And we as adults, and especially computer hobbyists, we all do this already. We're familiar with this method. But we're still sending our children to schools where they're almost prisoners of the teacher. Um, and I worry that if formal educa educators and the formal education establishment doesn't realize that today's learners have been liberated, they're free to learn however they want to, that schools and, and universities are going to become obsolete. We don't need this old structure anymore. They may become uh, extinct. So, if we go back to the original question, how has the personal computer changed learning? I don't think it's changed learning at all. Children have been teaching themselves to walk and talk since we came down from the trees. Um, those are the two most difficult things we ever learn. Um, adults have been acquiring new skills throughout their lives as conditions change, as environments change, as technologies change around them. We're always learners, and we're always teachers. Sometimes we teach um, on purpose, intentionally. But even when we do not intend to teach, 
other people are watching us and we are, uh, we are teaching whether we like it or not. Um, most of the learning that goes on goes on sp spontaneously through observation, through copying, through practice, through play. Um, only that which we don't learn spontaneously is, is what gets put into the classroom and needs to be taught. So our new technologies, including the, the personal computer, let us explore distant and dangerous environments through simulations that we, and, and through um, being able to view what's going on across the globe um, through simulations and through virtual reality. But learning, I don't think, has been changed. What we learn in many cases has been changed, but the process of learning is the same. And for humans, will always be. How has the personal computer changed teaching? Sadly, I don't think it's changed it enough, um, especially in formal education. I think educators have two challenges. The first is to understand how our access to information has changed. Teachers, traditional teachers, still think of themselves as the source of the information for their students, and they're not anymore. There's so much more information out there than any teacher can know that it's kind of, it's, it's a losing proposition for a teacher to try and say, oh, I'm the expert in this, you should learn from me. The environment is full of know-how and knowledge, so that the role of the teacher has to change. Another aspect that's changed is that we can no longer use force or violence against, te against children to force them to learn. We have to appeal to their motivation, their internal motivation, much more than the traditional school is designed to do. That's a real challenge. We've just begun to try and figure out how to do that. Right now, we're struggling with what do we do with our kids who are locked into the screens and locked into video games? Are they learning what we want them to learn? Um, we don't know how to entice them to learn what we want them to learn. I think that we've missed an opportunity because um, uh, one of my grandson, my grandson is 15 and a com complete computer nerd. Um, and one of his favorite games is Assassin's Creed. So he plays this game, which has, is, takes place in a historical context. But the history that's embedded in that game is so small compared to what it could be. If we want this kid to learn about the history, and it just so happens that his own ancestors are many of the characters in this game, if we wanted him to learn that, we could embed all of that information in the game so that while the game playing is the initial motivation, he's absorbing the other information that we want him to learn. Um, when, we have a, when we show a movie, even if it isn't interactive, when we show a film, we could have how to do many of the skills that we want people to acquire demonstrated in the background of that action in the film. In virtual reality, I actually, my son, who's a movie producer and virtual reality producer, um, we have a project um, which we are calling, uh, we haven't talked to Steve Wozniak about this, but the, the, the name, if we ever do it, is Woz's Garage. And it's a virtual laboratory that lets you, it's a, it's a maker space that lets you build things in virtual reality. Um, these are things that we could be doing um, in schools and with both children and adults, uh, and we don't yet. So that's my vision of the future, is to go back to those original dreamers see what they laid out for us, and then take the technology that we have built over the last 40 years and say, aha, 
Today, we can do that. We can do it in virtual reality. We can do it in simulations. We can ask the question, what can you learn through, through a distance medium? And what do you have to do face to face? There are things that you can't learn uh, over through a screen or in a virtual reality situation that you must learn interacting person to person. What are those things? A classroom is the most expensive technology we have for teaching. Online teaching and learning is the cheapest. What do we want to spend our money and our resources on uh, that's most important to do face to face? What can we do remotely and virtually? And that's the challenge for education in the future. Thank you for listening. I, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, um, but I'm happy to answer questions if we do. And I'll be around during the whole conference, so I'm happy to talk to any of you. This is just an introduction to the kinds of things that I would love to be talking about. Se ci sono, oh, esatto. se ci sono domande per Liza, eh, io posso aiutare nella traduzione se volete. Ok. Um, hi, I would like to play the devil's advocate in, in this contest. How do you see um, the, the problems uh, brought by the huge amount of information and stimuli in young people today? Um, I mean, what causes uh, a major laziness in acquiring new information because they have everything is ready to use and everything is available everywhere. Um, phenomena like uh, the um, functional illiteracy, for example. I love that question, thank you. Um, I, I think we have um, two things that we need to look at to respond to um, what the kids are learning today, which makes them appear lazy to us. I don't think they're lazy. I think, and I don't think that they're not learning. I think they're learning a huge amount. But what we are offering them through the modi modality that they spontaneously want to go to is very small. It's Japanese anime. It's, um, it's cartoons. It's very simple video games. Um, we could, if we worked with, um, let me go back to this slide here. Um, if, we, if we combine, and, and actually I got a, a message from a friend who was at Google and about to leave Google, and one of his friends is the author of Myst, and I just got a message from them saying, we're thinking of doing an educational product, would you like to work with us? And I'm jumping up and down. Oh, yes, I would. Because we need to take what we know about teaching and learning and embed it in what is attractive to the learner. That way, in some senses, they're lazy. But we all know that it's much easier to learn what you're excited about than it is to learn something that somebody else says you ought to learn because it's good for you. So let's take advantage of the fact that computing and games are motivational and we learn from them spontaneously. If we only have this very weak set of information embedded in the game, they will only learn that. If we put a huge amount of background information into the game so they get it incidentally, some of them will choose to pay attention to it. So we have to design the, the learning environment so that there are many pathways, many twisted little passages, all different, um, that they can go down. They will learn different things, so we won't have the same homogeneous outcome from our educational system if we do this. We will have many more different specialties, different sets of know-how. 
But I don't think there's any, I, I don't think the problem is that the kids are lazy or that we're lazy. I don't think it is that it's too easy, um, that there are too much is handed to them. I think not enough is being handed to them. And if we make the pathways open those doors, they will, they will learn. And thank you for your very interesting and inspiring talk, first of all. Um, actually, I have two questions. One is more <laughs> about the past. And since I read that there was some opposition to the use of computers in the very early times of personal computers because uh, teachers in those cases w were fearing they could be overcome and replaced by computers, which is something similar to what's happening now with artificial intelligence. So uh, how or if and how uh, could you explain them and let them to think it was an opportunity and rather than a threat? And second quick question is, uh, I will use an old fashioned term maybe, which is uh, intelligent tutoring systems. Nowadays, it's not <laughs> any more fashionable, but uh, are those kinds of technologies still of interest? And in case, what would be um, a first set of needs to be um, to be implemented in this kind of systems for being useful for what you talked about. Thank you very, thank you very much. Okay, now you're challenging me to remember both questions at once. I can't guarantee that. You may have to ask again. Um, I went back to this slide uh, that's about Bob Albrecht um, because he had a, a good strategy for working with teachers resistant to the technology. Um, he said, and I agree, that part of the resistance was not, part of the resistance was that teachers didn't understand or know how to use computers and did not want to feel foolish in front of their students. So what Bob did was he put the computer in the teacher's room, in the teacher's lounge, where the teachers went to have their coffee and relax so that they had the opportunity to play with the computer without an audience, with no students present, so that they could learn and gain enough confidence so they were willing to have this new um, strange device in their classroom. So that was one strategy. Um, and of course, the other stra another strategy is to get a student to do the teaching of the computer because there's always two or three in every school and hopefully one in every classroom who's much better than the, uh, the teacher at managing the technology. <laughs> um, there was lots of resistance. You'll see if you go to um, the, this virtual museum, uh, there's a letter um, from, God, I'd have to look it up to find out who wrote it. It was, but it was to one of the uh, educational pioneers. So it was funny that this letter got written to that person um, saying that, uh, that computers in, in education and in schools is a conspiracy of the computer manufacturers to try and get this to waste our money. Um, and certainly huge quantities of mon money have been wasted and still are being wasted in buying um, hardware without a maintenance contract <laughs> because it breaks down even new ones um, and without appropriate software. Um, and what we find, I mean, it, you know that when you put, when you give a, a, a kid a computer and an internet connection, they go learn a whole bunch of stuff and they again going to embarrass the teacher. So, we're now spending a whole lot of, of money effort and programming effort confining what our kids can access on the internet because we're afraid they're gonna learn something we don't want them to learn. We don't want them just to learn everything they can. Um, so those are, those are two ways that we are still experiencing resistance instead of uh, doing something like saying to the kids, Yes, you will be able to access pornography. 
you need to know what it is and know whether and, and learn that you don't want to waste your time. There are more interesting things. And for some people, there aren't more interesting things. But those kids will get into it anyway. It's uh, kind of like the philosophy that I had with my children about drugs. Because being a hippie in San Francisco, my children had access to anything they wanted. Um, and so rather than say, no, I'm going to close the doors and k try to protect you from this, I try to inoculate them against it and say, here's what happens. Look at this person. This is what happens if you don't control your use of drugs. We need to teach our children, this is what happens if you don't control your, in your use of information. If you become addicted um, to screens, to silly little games, if you waste your time, if you become, I mean, one of the concerns I have about virtual reality is that it's addictive. And what we know, the horrible thing about addiction is that people don't take care of their bodies if they're addicted to something and they will do this behavior until they die. We're going to lose some people that way. But if we go early and we share the dangers with our children and our families and ourselves, I think we can outlive that. Um, the other question was about the use of artificial intelligence for education. Okay, I think that the most important thing that we can do today that we couldn't do before is to analyze the student's way of learning. Um, and we can also do that through games. Uh, there's a fascinating, I didn't try to put that in this talk. I was trying to take things out, not put things in, because I knew I had a limited amount of time. Um, there's a wonderful theory called The Structure of Intellect uh, by J.P. Guilford, and I have another slide set on that, which you can access if you want, um, which instead of having one measure of intelligence, IQ, it has 128 different intelligences. And now that, that was done actually in the, in the 40s, this theory, and now there are more intelligences that we know and talk about. So if what you do is have a game that is fun to play and is doing collecting big data on the student and how they learn, and how they prefer to learn, what is exciting and turns them on, what turns them off? Do they want, some, some learners like to be lost most of the time. They like to play in new environments where they don't know what's going on. Other people love to be in control they like to get the right answer. They like to win this level and get to the next level and get to the next level. If the game is too hard too fast, it's discouraging and they quit. So if we develop some software in a game format that collects this information as the learner makes choices about what they like to do, um, we can create profiles that because the profile becomes the property of the learner. Then we need to match the profile of the learner with the profile of the learning, inform the information, the way the information is delivered, and the goals. That's why we have a triangle here. Let me go back to that one. Where is it? Here we go. Um, we're matching the goals of the learner, what interests them and excites them, or what they think they need to learn. If they say, oh, I need to learn to cook because nobody's cooking for me anymore. Maybe they don't like to cook, but they want to learn how to do it. It doesn't necessarily have to be something they like, but it does have to be something they're drawn to that they want to learn. Um, with the profile of the learner, which goes in this corner, with all those resources, including a teacher, because some people like to learn from somebody else who's an expert. I mean, part of why we came here to be be, be speakers is because you like to listen to us experts. So I'm down here as a resource for you, as is Al and all the other speakers. Um, so this model is where I think we can go, and the AI technology will help us get there. I'm not particularly interested in having uh, a simulated human being, which is part of where we're going with AIs, uh, be the teacher. Um, but 
it, that which we can, can give in print or in video is fine, but that which has to have the personal connection. Um, sometimes that person is remote, sometimes that person is, um, is in the same room with you or sitting right next to you. Um, that's where I think we can go in the future. And I'm, I'm hoping that if I, as I do talks like this, we will have more people work on this problem rather than how to get you to um, click on something and buy something else. La faccio in italiano. Io ho due figli e quando io usavo internet c'era alta vista come motore di ricerca, per chi se lo ricorda. E le risposte alle domande erano veramente poche. Oggi quando ci mettiamo alla ricerca di un'informazione, le risposte sono tantissime. È difficile trovare l'informazione giusta, la troviamo solo perché ci siamo noi che abbiamo la conoscenza. Un ragazzo troppo giovane trova quasi sempre una risposta non coerente alla ricerca. La domanda è, once upon a time, when the, the only search engine was Alta Vista, you got the answers to your question because there was not so much information around. Now information is too much, but uh, the, you, you only find uh, um, answers, uh, but if you do, do not put uh, your own knowledge in understanding uh, the, the questions, you, you have not two questions. The, the question was, oh, sorry, uh, how can uh, kids today uh, have, uh, can have real answers without having the knowledge that helps them to understand the meaning of the answers? They just get information and not knowledge. Uh, I think, is that okay? I, I think that that problem has always existed, uh, and it's not unique to computers. Um, we, can, we only understand language in context. Um, so you're, you're using the words knowledge and information. Um, I add the word context, which is all the tacit, the unspoken knowledge that you have about a situation. We understand in an environment. So traditionally we say that in schools kids learn reading, writing, arithmetic, history, governments, civics, um, and how can they understand and answer their questions if they don't have that context. Um, what happens, I think, today, as we saw with the Mitra hole-in-the-wall experiment, is if you give kids the resources, they will teach themselves, most of them will teach themselves reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, they don't need writing so much, but they will teach themselves keyboarding. Um, and those who can learn it spontaneously will, in answering the questions of their little brothers and sisters and their friends, will teach each other. Um, so this, the basic learning um, of the, the fundamentals of communication, I think, um, can be learned without a school classroom. Um, the interpretation of the information, um, you're speaking to someone who lives in the United States uh, <coughs> um, we have a huge controversy over fake news. What is true? It depends on who you are. It depends on what your context is. Um, if you go to a religious school, you will learn something entirely different than if you go to a secular school. If you go to an art, artist-oriented school, you'll learn something entirely different from if you go to a science-oriented school. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't solve that problem. It's been there forever. It will get um, more complex uh, as we 
expand our, our knowledge and our resources. I do want to make one point about information, and that is that I don't think our problem is that we have more information, more bits coming toward us than we ever had before. Um, I like to think about if you're standing um, in a garden and you look down and you look uh, in a one meter square place at your feet, there is a huge amount of information below you. There are insects, there are all kinds of plants, there are minerals, there are soils, there's weather, um, there's changing that goes on. We ignore most of that information. We have learned to filter. So we know what's important to us to take in and pay attention to and what's important to us to ignore. We evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to have this filter, this way of knowing for us, it's important to pay att attention to the traffic and not walk out into the street. If we were living in a tribe in the jungle in Africa, we would pay attention, much more attention to um, the animal sounds and the pathways. Um, so what information is relevant to us, to each of us, is different in different contexts. We get co information over screens, um, and through auditory information now, which is new, and we haven't had a chance to evolve how to screen out the irrelevant stuff. So we are now dealing with a huge amount of information we don't need and can't use. And that's going to be, our children in some senses are better at screening that stuff out than we are. So that's another challenge for the future. How do we bring up our children and teach each other to survive and thrive in this new information environment. We've always been in an information environment, but the nature of the information has changed. Uh, I try in English, but uh, if you don't understand me, I repeat uh, in Italian to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, during the topic, uh, you say uh, the actual school and the universities is just old. But uh, like uh, me, uh, now I'm a university student uh, and I finished the high, middle uh, and the elementary school. Um, all the topic uh, until the middle school, I think, uh, uh, sound so good because um, in this age, the, the kids uh, more, uh, pay more attention about uh, the game and not the, the knowledge. But uh, in the high school and now in the university, I understand how, is, how much is important for a student to uh, try, uh, try the, cu the curiosity and uh, searching the, the response without the teacher. The teacher is help. Uh, with this uh, is an helper. This, uh, in this uh, approach, uh, all, uh, all important in the game, I think uh, the guy uh, have a risk to to lose the the, the skill about uh, the research. Very often in my family we talk about uh, new tech, uh, new uh, a new type of uh, um, learning. Uh, in the past uh, is a encyclopedia uh, learning yeah. uh, all, all the guy have to learn all now we the, the guy the, the young guy like me uh, think is most important uh, this, uh, know how discover if they need in this approach uh, is it possible because uh, the teacher is not the center of the classroom but the guy event the space to to search uh, uh, what they w uh, want to know and after uh, try it. I, I think I got it, but you tell me if I answer your question. Um, so we're, we're asking about knowing how to do research, knowing how to discover what information is important. Information and skills are important to you. And um, whether the kids are learning this or not. 
If you look at a, a very small child before they go to school, they are excellent researchers. They are very good at looking at their environment, searching out what interests them, exploring it, experimenting. Then we put them in school and they're told, don't do that. Stop exploring, stop experimenting. Do what the teacher tells you to do, learn this. Don't learn that outside the window. Don't learn how many birds sit in the branch you can see. Learn this on the page. Um, the challenge, I think, is not to destroy that ability to explore and learn, but to expand it so that they have not only looking out the window, but looking through the screen. Um, and also to learn, again, to filter the information so that they can follow a coherent path that gets them to the solution to the problem they want to solve. That's a skill that some people spontaneously develop and other people don't. So as we build that profile of the learner, that all the characteristics of the learner, one of the things we would know is the learner, him or herself, would know, I'm very good at, maybe I'm good at painting, and I can copy a picture, uh, something I see in nature, and put it on a, uh, on a flat piece of canvas. But I'm very bad at figuring out how to work my cell phone. So to do this, I need a teacher. To do that, I just need to explore on myself by myself. So I'm not advocating taking the teacher away. The teacher is an extremely important resource, more important for some learners than others. So if what we do is make the environment, the learning environment, specific for the learner so that we have optimized, so that we give the best learning environment to each learner, then wouldn't that make you happy? Ok, uh, dobbiamo chiudere, saremo qua tutto il giorno a parlare con Liza, però ci sono altri eventi che vanno avanti, quindi grazie a tutti quanti per aver assistito alla conferenza. Thank you very much Liza for your very interesting conference.